So um, today we are continuing the series on the book of Jonah. I mean, two Sundays ago, Pastor Lawrence preached on Jonah chapter 1, and today we move on to Jonah chapter 2. Uh, Jonah chapter 2 is actually a really, really short uh, chapter, uh, only 10, 10 verses. All right? But in a, lot, in a lot of ways, Jonah chapter 2 is the crux to the whole story. It's really crucial to, to the story of the book of Jonah. Um, and it, it, it obviously sits uh, before Jonah's actions in, in chapter 1, his response to God's call in chapter 1, and his subsequent actions in chapter 3 and 4. So, you know, logically, you know, without chapter 2, there is no chapter 3, there's no chapter 4. So without chapter 2, the story does not continue. So let's just pray. Father God, we thank you, God, for the privilege of, um, of listening to your word. Um, I was just reminded so many times, Father God, your, even your word in Isaiah, which says that your word, Father God, that goes forth, does not come back void, Father Lord, but it, Father, it will fulfill the purpose that you have set it out to be. Father God, we claim, Father God, that the word of God is sharper than any double-edged sword, able to cut through bone and marrow, cutting into our spirit, and we pray that you will speak to us with that still, small voice, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. That next slide, please. So, um, a lot of us are familiar with the, the story of Jonah, right? We would have uh, heard it in Sunday school, or we would have read it in children's books. Uh, and what I have on the screen, and actually what I'm holding in my hand, is actually the children's book which I had when I was four years old. All right, so it's kept, it's kept really well. Um, it was at a time when books were $1.25 or dollar. $1.35, all right? So that's how cheap books were in those days. Um, and there's a beautiful story there. And, um, but the story of the book of Jonah is really a lot, lot deeper than what these few uh, picture pages can show. Um, it's just the lessons that we can learn are so, so much deeper. So let's, let's just d jump and, and, and dwell into the lessons from the book of Jonah today, Jonah chapter 2. So just a reminder, a bit of recap. Chapter 1, we saw that God had a task for Jonah. Right, to preach against the city of Nineveh. And in response, Jonah ran away. And Jonah found a ship headed to Tarshish, which, as uh, Pastor Lawrence said, is the direct opposite of the direction of where he was supposed to go. So Nineveh is here, Tarshish is there, and instead of going to Nineveh, he went to Tarshish. So Jonah boarded that ship, and he fell asleep. And, but Jonah, of course, you know, he should have known he can never run away from the presence of God, isn't it? Psalm 139 says, where can I go from your spirit? From where can I flee from your presence? And God sent a wind and a storm that was so violent, so strong that the ship was breaking apart. And on the ship, the sailors were panicking, right? If we were on the ship, we would be panicking, we would be freaking out, all right? So they were freaking out and they were panicking and each was praying to their own God. That's what the Bible says. And they woke Jonah because Jonah was sleeping and they said, you know, what's going on? And Jonah told them, I'm running away from God, the God who made the sea and the God who made the land. And the sailors asked Jonah, what should we do to calm the sea? And Jonah said, throw me into the sea. Throw me into the sea. And the sailors didn't want to, you know, because it's such a horrible thing to do. But eventually they did. They chucked him into the sea. And that's the end of chapter 1, where it says in verse 17, the Lord provided a great fish to swallow Jonah and Jonah was inside the fish three days and three nights. So at this point, it's worthwhile examining Jonah's heart attitude, right? He was running from God. That part is obvious. It's very clear as running from God. But talking about his heart attitude, Jonah was fixed and Jonah was stubborn with his intentions. He ran from his home down to the seaport and from there onto a ship that would take him the opposite direction from where God wanted him to go. And this is very important here. Through the storm, Jonah was unrepentant and did not turn back to God. Through the big, violent storm, with the wind and the waves and the ship breaking apart, Jonah was stubborn and unrepentant and did not turn to God. The Bible says that the sailors were all praying, but Jonah, the prophet of God, was not praying. How ironic, the only believer on the ship was the only one who was not praying. So God, Jonah continued to run from God, even through the storm. And Jonah continued to run from God even into the sea. Right? Rather than repenting to God, rather than saying to God, I'm sorry, I made a mistake, rather than asking God for forgiveness and for help, Jonah chose to be thrown into the raging sea. 
Right, his attitude reminds me of lots of places in the Bible it talks of that kind of attitude, but it, it says so beautifully in Zephaniah chapter 3 about the city of Jerusalem. Woe to the city of oppressors, rebellious and defiled. She obeys no one. She accepts no correction. She trusts, she does not trust in the Lord. She does not draw near to God. So let's also think about the challenges that were faced by Jonah. Right, we talked about the wind and the waves that were so strong that the ship was breaking apart. We talked about being thrown into the raging sea. Right, can you imagine being thrown into the raging sea, tossed about by the waves until he couldn't take it anymore and he sunk down, drowning into the dark water, dark cold water. And then he's swallowed by this giant fish where he stayed for three days and three nights. So we talk a little bit about the belly of the fish. Right? A lot of us, as you say, we are familiar with these children's stories. And when we look at these children's books, it's like they cartoon it up, right? It's not so bad in there. There's lots of room. There's light. Um, I've seen pictures where they've got holding candles in there. Um, I've seen pictures where they, you know, Jonah even has a table and a chair and a bed in there. Um, there's friendly creatures to keep you company. Um, it's, it's really not such a bad place. You, know, you could probably spend three days and three nights there, have a bit of vacation, right? But in reality, it would have been very, very different. In reality, Jonah would have been in total darkness. In reality, Jonah would have no room to move because he would have been pressed into the guts of the fish. He would be in the fish's stomach or the fish's intestine, so with no or little room to move. He could probably barely even breathe. And even whatever he did breathe, right, who here you know, buys fresh fish from the fishmonger? Right? A few classy people here do. Buy fresh fish from the fishmonger. Who goes fishing? Fishing, right? Fishing, right? The smell of fish is really lovely, isn't it? It's something you want to wake up to in the morning and just breathe it in, right? No, it's not, that's not the case, all right? It's pretty, pretty horrible. And that's what Jonah smelled for three days and three nights. Another thing, um, you know, who's been on roller coasters or onto rocking boats and ships? Yeah, quite a few of you probably, right? And I know for me, it's not the most comfortable feeling in the world. I actually avoid... Uh, boats and ships if I can, because I do get uh, a little seasick. And can you imagine Jonah in this fish, up and down and left and right, and wherever the fish, wherever God sent the fish to go, Jonah would have gone with the fish. So it would have been a dark, tight, smelly, nauseous ride for Jonah. So it would have been a horrible, horrible experience for us. Not like this uh, beautiful picture we have up there. So I've shared this story before. Um, um, I was on the way home from work, and I was catching the bus home, and it was raining. So all of us waiting for the bus were under the bus shelter, and we were all um, squeezed up to try to get away from the rain. So because we were close, we could hear what each other was saying. So there was this little boy, about eight years old, and his uh, carer or his aunt was with him. And um, the carer or the aunt was, was asking him a question. And she said, do you think it is a superpower if you cannot feel pain? if you cannot feel pain. And the boy said, yeah, I'll be a superhero. I won't be able to feel pain. But then the carer or the aunt said, what would happen if your leg's on fire? You wouldn't, you wouldn't even be aware of it and your, your leg could just burn right off. Pain is a way of our body to warn us away from danger. And I was standing there listening to this conversation. And my first thought was, this is a really, really profound conversation to have with an eight-year-old boy. But the second thought I had was there's a lot in tr of truth in what this lady was saying to the little boy because sometimes God in his mercy allows us to feel the pain of the consequences of our actions. Sometimes in his mercy, God allows us to feel the pain of the consequences of our actions. You know, it says in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 11, no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. But later on, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Now, it's important to note that discipline is not the same thing as punishment. Discipline is about refining. Discipline is about correcting. Discipline is about restoring. It's like a parent who wants to restore their child or discipline their child so that the child learns to do the right thing. So discipline is actually about grace. You know, God could have let Jonah go to Tarshish. Jonah was dead set going on to Tarshish. God could have let 
Jonah to go to Tarshish? Do you think God did not have anybody else he could have called to go to Nineveh? God could have let Jonah go when he did not repent through the storm. I've sent you a huge storm. You don't want to repent? Maybe I can let you go. God could have let Jonah go when he jumps into the sea. You would rather jump into the raging sea than to listen to me than to repent. Maybe it's time to let you go. But God chose to send a giant fish instead. You know, the book of Jonah in chapters 3 and 4 tells us about the mercy that God had on the people of Nineveh. But let's consider the mercy and the grace that God had on Jonah. Right? So the storm, the raging sea, the belly of the fish are all actually acts of grace. They're acts of a gracious God. We've got to get our heads around that. They're acts of grace. It's not acts of punishment. They're acts of grace. And through the storm, through the raging sea, through the belly of the fish, God was providing a way of escape for Jonah. You see, Jonah was done with God, but God was not done with Jonah. God was giving Jonah a chance to be obedient. God was giving Jonah a chance not to fall into the sin of omission, to fall into the sin of not following God's direction. It was a chance that God was giving to come back to God. And finally, finally, after struggling through the storm, through the ship breaking apart, to being thrown into the raging waters, to drowning, to three days and three nights in the belly of the fish, which is horrible and dark and smelly and nauseous, God finally got Jonah's attention. And Jonah came to his senses. You know, the story of Jonah is really familiar to us, as we say, right? We know it through our Sunday school stories. We know it through our children's books. Um, and a lot of these children's stories, they tend to give a very light touch to Jonah chapter 2. They like to jump straight to the last verse where Jonah escapes from the belly of the fish, which is verse 10. But, you know, verse 1 to verse 9 of Jonah chapter 2 is where the real work, the real work actually happened. So let's read that together. Jonah chapter 2. From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. He said, In my distress, I called to the Lord, and he answered me. From deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help, and you listened to my cry. You hurled me from the depths and into the very heart of the sea, and the currents swirled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. I said, I have been banished from your sight, yet I will look again toward your holy temple. The engulfing waters threatened me, the deep surrounded me, seaweed was wrapped around my head. To the roots of the mountains I sank down, the earth beneath barred me in forever. But you, Lord my God, brought my life up from the pit. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. But I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will make good. I will say, salvation comes from the Lord. And then in verse 10, And the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. You know, it's interesting that Jonah turns back to God, not, you know, in the port of Joppa, not in the violent storm, not in the raging sea, but in the silence of the fish's stomach fish's belly. You know, in the quiet of the fish's belly, it is there that God gets Jonah's attention. Sometimes God will bring us to the point where it's just you and it's God. You know, it is a point where you feel you can go no further because the usual priorities, the usual distractions, they're not priorities and distractions anymore. There's no works for you to do. There's no tasks that, you, that, that seems so important. There's no money you can give. There's no good deeds. It's really just you and God. And it, in the Bible, we hear a lot of stories about how God speaks to his people in the desert or he speaks to people in the wilderness, isn't it? Or maybe that's just where his people are a bit more inclined to hear the still, small voice of God. You know, the, in, that's where you know, God spoke to Moses where God spoke to Elijah, where God spoke to John the Baptist, even Jesus himself was tested in the wilderness or in the desert. And up here on the screen, you can see the Hebrew word for desert, which is midbar, and the Hebrew word for speaking, 
which is Midabar. And if you look at those two texts in the Hebrew, you will tell that they are exactly the same Hebrew text. Can you see that? It's exactly the same. There's no difference. And they come speaking, and desert actually come from the same root word in Hebrew. That's amazing, isn't it? It's amazing that language speaks to us of God and God's move through the generations and through history. God speaks to his people in the desert. God speaks to us sometimes through the desert experience. You know, there's a saying which says that in the desert is where the true state of the heart is revealed. It's a place of revelation, testing, refining, humbling, which often results in deeper intimacy with God. In the desert, you strip away the noises, you strip away the distractions, and it is just you and just God. And for Jonah, his desert was the belly of a giant fish. Uh, and what did Jonah do in the belly of a giant fish? So Jonah chapter 2, verse 4, it says he will look again. Verse 7 says that Jonah remembers the Lord. Now these words here, they indicate a return. They indicate a coming back. All right? They show that Jonah used to look to God. Remember the Bible says that he's a prophet of God. So Jonah used to look to God. But at some stage, Jonah stopped. Maybe when he was starting to run away. At some stage, he stopped looking to God. So Jonah may have been running from God's instructions. But some of us, listen here, some of us here, whether we know it or not, we are running away from God himself. Some of us here, we come before God in our own terms. We come before God and in his house when it's convenient for us. We come in prayer before God when, God, I need something from you. We lift up our hands in worship when the person next to us lifts up their hand. You know, we seek our own agenda rather than God's own agenda. Our service to God becomes routine. Our Christian walk becomes a little bit comfortable. Our duty to God becomes more important than our relationship with God. And without knowing it, without realizing, we have stopped looking to God. Without knowing it, we have fallen into a kind of spiritual blindness, a kind of spiritual deafness. Our spiritual eyes stop seeing. Our spiritual ears stop hearing. And that is a place of complacency, and that's a place of apathy. If you look back to Jonah chapter 1, what was Jonah doing on the ship? Jonah was sleeping on that ship. Through the storm, through his running away from God, he was sleeping. Right? He did not even know there was a storm until somebody came and woke him up and told him, hey, we're in the middle of a storm here. Oh, okay. He was sleeping. That is complacency. You know, that's the place where we start to move into the permissive will of God rather than God's perfect will. You know, it's a place where we are lukewarm, right? The Bible talks about being lukewarm. We are neither hot nor cold. But what does God actually expect from us? Matthew chapter 6, 33 says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Seek first. Matthew 22 says, The greatest commandment is this, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, with all your mind. Right? Some of us, we need to return to God. And sometimes it takes a Jonah-like experience to shake us out of that complacency, a Jonah-like experience to reveal the priority of our hearts. And there's a saying that I read somewhere. It says, the situation that drives you to your knees is a good one. The situation that drives you to your knees is a good one. And I actually, when I first read it, I didn't appreciate it. I just read it and I put it aside because it didn't sound empathetic. It didn't sound kind. It didn't sound caring. But when I thought deeper into it, I thought it actually makes sense. You know, because being on our knees is where we should be in the first place. We should, being on knees is where we should be in our first place. Seek first the kingdom of God. Love the Lord with all our heart, our soul, and our mind. Return to the Lord. You know, another great story in the Bible on returning to God is from the book of Hosea. And I know Melvin loves the story from the book of Hosea. He's preached on it um, several times. And it's actually, if you read the book of Hosea, it's quite a sad book because for most of it, the people of Israel, the children of Israel are running away from God. They are departed from God. They are fleeing from God. But the last chapter, oh, such a beautiful chapter, chapter 14 
of the book Hosea is beautiful because it talks about Israel's return, Israel's coming back to God. In verse 14, verse 1, O in chapter 14, verse 1, O Israel, return to the Lord your God, for you have stumbled because of your iniquity. Take words with you and return to the Lord. Say to him, take away all iniquity, receive us graciously, for we offer the sacrifices of our lips. What did Jonah's return to God look like? You know, in the whole of chapter 2, we see that Jonah was speaking with God. He was speaking with God. When we return to God, we take words with us. That's from Hosea chapter 4. We take words with us because words are the essence of communication. Now, I've been married for more than 24 years. Um, and, you know, husbands and wives, they have our fair share of disagreements and arguments, right? Who's married here? Married? Do you have your fair share of disagreements and arguments? Yeah. Yep. Those of you who <laughs> Thank you, Uncle Gilbert. If you say no, you're lying, all right? It is, all right, it is true. You have our fair share of disagreements and arguments. Um, and Helene and I, we've had that fair share as well. Now, after a disagreement, I'll feel sorry. I'll feel bad. I'll feel really bad and I'll feel really sorry after I have a disagreement and argument. But when I was newly married, I didn't know how to handle this. All right? When I was newly married, I thought that I could resolve the argument by rubbing Helene's arms and shoulders. I'll be like... <laughs> so I would do this, all right? <laughs> I'll be like... Um, <laughs> so... Um, Rub the arm, rub the shoulder. It's the first sure sign of getting your wife back on board, showing her that I was sorry, that I felt bad. But I soon found out that rubbing the shoulder or the arm doesn't cut it, all right? When it comes to resolving issues, somehow it doesn't work, okay? Because feeling sorry is not the same as saying you're sorry. Rubbing her arm is not the same as having a conversation to talk through and resolve the issue with Helene. It is the same with God. Feelings are very well and good, but they are not communicating. We need to talk with God, just as Jonah did. The whole of Jonah chapter 2, Jonah talked with God. In verses 1 to 9, you can see him processing. Right? When you read verses 1 to 9, it's like all over the place. He's saying this, he's saying that, because he's trying to make sense of what happened to him. Remember, he's from the storm into the ship, drowning in the water, three days and nights in the belly of fish. He doesn't know what's going on. All right? He didn't know... He didn't have anything figured out. He didn't know whether he was going to survive this thing even. He was probably emotional, probably scared, right? Anxious, stressed, probably angry with himself, angry with different things, regretful, embarrassed, ashamed. But none of these things stopped him from talking to God. Verse 2 says that he cried out to the Lord. So Jonah was talking to God, and that was all that mattered. Because talking to God was the start of his return back to God. And the same is for us. We may be in a mess. We may not know up from down, left from right. We may feel like we are in the dark. We may feel masses of emotions. Our emotions changes every five minutes. But that's okay because God is waiting for us to speak with Him. So let's just talk with God. Now, you know, for, for me, when I talk to God, um, I like to go to a quiet place. I like to take a walk. So I like to take long walks. I like to take a drive where it's just myself, and I just talk to God. But that's me. You may have your own um, way or style to talk to God. But I can tell you, it's not, there's no need for religious talk. There's no need for religious speech, unless it's how you speak normally. There's no way for these or thou's or, or thou or God or things like that. Just talk to God like you talk to your friend, because that's what God is. Talk to God like you talk to your father, because that's who he is. So I tell God how I feel, even the really bad stuff, all right? the stuff that I'm actually a little bit embarrassed about. You know, I tell God I feel angry with this thing. I tell God I feel betrayed about this thing. I feel let down. How could this thing happen? This doesn't make sense. I'm working through it. I, it just doesn't make sense. I don't understand. These are the things that I bring before God. And sometimes it has to be a long conversation. But that's what taking words mean, talking with God. And that's what Jonah did. And that leads us to our third point here, that Jonah was open and honest with God and open and honest with himself. So being open and honest with God means admitting things with him that you may have never shared with anyone else. Right? Things that you would rather even not admit, even to yourself. Right? All of us have got things that we would rather not admit, even to ourselves. We push it aside for the, 
bottom of our souls, to the bottom of our minds, to the bottom of our spirits. But you know, one thing about challenges and trials is they can reveal our true selves. They can reveal the priorities of our hearts, the true intentions and the thoughts of our hearts, isn't it? Aspects of ourselves that we may not even be aware of or choose not to be aware of. So there was this time Helene was helping me work through this challenging time that I had, and I was just talking through it with Helene and working my way through it. And later that night, Helene said, did you realize that you sounded angry as you were speaking? Did you realize you sounded angry as you were speaking? I was like, oh, I actually didn't even know. I didn't even realize it. But out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, isn't it? Luke chapter 6, 45. And I knew I needed to deal with this with God. So I took words with God and I went on a long walk that night to just pray and talk it through with God. And I talked about the challenges that I was facing. I talked about the challenges I was facing with others. But as I talked to God, the interesting thing is what He turned the attention back to myself. You know, the challenges often impact situations, uh, other people, individuals, or organizations, or whatnot. But God turned the attention back to myself. You know, my pride my self-worth, you know, who I think I am, my identity bound up within the work that I was doing, things which I realized that I needed to process and work through with God. So we look back on Hosea chapter 14, returning to God. It says there, take away all iniquity. That's what returning to God means. We say to him, take away all iniquity. Other versions say, forgive us for our sin. That means that returning to God means having to acknowledge our sins, having to acknowledge our mistakes. You know, in Jonah chapter 2, verse 4, Jonah recognizes that he has been banished from God's sight. He acknowledges the trouble that he is in. He recognizes his situation, and Jonah takes responsibility. The interesting thing is that Jonah didn't point his fingers at other people. He didn't blame the people of Nineveh. Why are you guys so bad? that caused God to make me to go to Nineveh. He didn't blame the ship's captain. Why did you sail into the ship, into the storm? He didn't blame the sailors. Why didn't you guys, you know, rig up the ship properly so that we wouldn't be in this situation? He didn't blame the storm. He didn't blame the giant fish. He did not shift responsibilities to others. Sometimes we like to think or act that we have no role in the challenges that we are facing. You know, we point to the faults of others, um, but we forget the consequences of our own actions. We may point to the devil and say, you know, he's the one that's attacking, causing the issues that we face. But First John chapter 1, verse 8 says, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. So yes, there are times definitely that our challenges are due to other people. There are times even that our challenges are due to the attack of the enemy. By being open and honest with God means realizing that you may have contributed to the issue. If you find, if you find that you are always right, it is always somebody else who is in the wrong, it is always the devil's attack, then can I respectfully say that you may be off track? Hebrews 12, looking back to Hebrews 12, it says, talks about the value of God's discipline. But value only comes to those who have been trained by it. If the issue is with others or the issue is with the devil, then what discipline do you actually need? But it promises us that there's a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it, for those who acknowledge mistakes and learn from them. And here comes the most crucial point, all right? Jonah surrenders to God's sovereignty. Jonah recognizes that God is sovereign over the situation he is in. God is sovereign over Jonah himself. God is God and Jonah is not. So Jonah finally recognizes the foolishness of running away from God. He sees that he has to make right with God. I have to make right with God. There's nothing to do but surrender. I'm not going to fight. I'm not going to run anymore. You know, in Jonah chapter 2, verse 8, Jonah realizes that he's been chasing after worthless idols. How does that translate for us? What does that mean for us? We have to give up our idols. Now, we may not be worshipping like false idols or false gods, but 
perhaps we need to realign our priorities. What have we been putting that is more important than God? Is it our own plans? Is it our own attention, intentions? Is it our own agenda, our money, our works, your good works that you do, your duties, your ministry, or even your service? Because nothing takes precedence to your relationship with God. Well, are we running from God? Are we running from closeness with God? You know, if our, is our Christian walk a little bit too routine, a little bit too comfortable? Are we looking more to the duties that we do than actually to God himself? Now, this is a really tough verse, right, in um, Revelation chapter 2, verse 2 to 4. And God is saying to, the, to, to his church, I know your works, your labor, your patience, that you cannot bear those who are evil. So that's all good stuff. I know that you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Again, those are good stuff. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. And right at the end of chapter 2, Jonah sees that. He recognizes that God is his Lord. He has the ultimate revelation. Salvation is from the Lord. We are only saved through God. So despite his situation, despite being in the storm, despite the drowning, the agony of being in the belly of the fish, Jonah realizes that the only right response to God is what he says in verse 9. I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you. I will make good what I have vowed. He realizes the most important priority is making right his relationship with God. God is his God. And that means Jonah's role is to serve and worship God. Can I get the worship team up here, please? Thank you. Now, as we read through um, Jonah's, uh, the books of Jonah, chapter 1 and 2, it's really, really interesting and a bit confronting when we look at Jonah's life and actions as he runs from God. All right, when he goes from his home, he goes down to the port of Joppa, chapter 1, verse 3. On the ship, he was down below deck, chapter 1, verse 5. He goes down into the sea, chapter 1, verse 15, and he sinks down to the bottom of the sea, chapter 2, verse 6. When we are away from God, our life slowly but surely begins a downward spiral. Our life slowly but surely begins a downward spiral. Being cold, becoming cold, becoming spiritually complacent, right? Spiritually comfortable does not happen overnight. It happens slowly and surely. Slowly and surely, so we're not even aware of it. But something beautiful happens when Jonah returns to God. Jonah chapter 2, verse 6, that Jonah brings the God, a God brings Jonah's life up from the pit. And in verse 7, it says his prayer rose up to God. You know, maybe we are in a storm right now. Maybe we're stuck in the belly of the fish or in the desert. But we need to think, what is God speaking to us? What is his still small voice saying to us? He's shaking us out of our comfort zone. He's shaking us out of our complacency. He's asking us to surrender. He's saying, you do not need to run or to hide or fight anymore. He wants us to surrender to him. He wants us to return to our first love. Now, there's a, going back to Hosea chapter 14, there's something really beautiful. What happens when when the city, when um, Israel returns back to God? This is what God is saying. He says, I will heal their backsliding. I will love them freely, for my anger has turned away from him. Restor that's, that's talks about restoration of relationship with God. I will be like the dew to Israel, and he shall grow like the lily. There's a restoration of growth. And I will he will strengthen his roots like Lebanon. There's a restoration of strength. His branches will spread. His beauty shall be like the olive tree and his fragrance like Lebanon. There's a restoration of joy. And those who dwell under his shadow shall return. They shall be revived like grain and grow like a vine. And their scent like the wine of Lebanon. Now Jonah was done with God, but God was not done with Jonah. 
was not too late for Jonah, even in the belly of the fish, and it's not too late for us now as well. You know, ultimately, it's not how far Jonah was from God. You know, Jonah could be at the other ends of the earth, but it was how much love and grace that God had for Jonah. If we think about it, the whole time that Jonah was running, running from his home, running to the port, running to the ship, running through the storm, running through the sea, God loved Jonah through that whole time. And God loves you too. You know, we're going to have our sister, Alaris, um, minister to us this, this morning. And um, this song which um, Alaris is performing, I think it's a new song for, for all of us. And I just feel, you know, this is a God moment. This is a Holy Spirit moment here because today, the theme of today's message is about surrender. The theme of today's message is about returning to God. It's about coming back to God. So even as uh, Alaris and the worship team ministers to us through these words, can we just open up, open up to hear the still small voice that God has for us? Because God is speaking to us 